Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Inner Loop YouTube channel. I'm Lena, the new face of our Authors Corner series, and today I'll be having a conversation with Cameron McKenzie about his short story collection, River Weather, out from Alternating Currents Press. For more Cameron and more Authors Corner, you can check out our website to find articles, interviews, podcast episodes, and most importantly, a link to purchase the book. So welcome, Cameron. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Liam. It's great to be here. So I love this collection, and I would love to start by talking about setting, which sort of acts as a thread that seems to unify the stories in the collection. So the heart of the collection seems to lie on the periphery, but a familiar periphery to many of the viewers who are already Interloop community members, um, namely the edges of development in Virginia. Um, and the city sort of haunts the characters' lives from afar. So why suburbia for the setting of stories about masculinity and the sort of intricacies um, and really the intimacies of class conflict? Yeah, well, the I mean, the short answer is that that's where I grew up. So I wrote about where I grew up. But the that, I, I think that you're, um, you have really good insight into why suburbia works for these sorts of stories, because the stories are kind of about the ground shifting underneath people's feet, um, the way that things had been no longer are. And a lot of these characters are sort of late to get that news. And a lot of the stories are the characters getting that news, or rather that news is trying to be delivered. Um, and as such, the, the if you're out in the country, the country is the country, it's its own thing. And the city, I feel, is also very similar. But in the suburbs, it's this sort of liminal space where a lot of things are contested by both sides. Um, certainly, growing up in Northern Virginia at the time, you know that had been all farmland for for uh, centuries. And all of a sudden, there's an influx of money and people from around the world that are just you know raising the forests and throwing up monstrous homes, and nobody knows. Nobody there, anyway, nobody that lived in Loudoun County necessarily knew why. What were these people for? What are they doing? Um, and the people that were coming in, uh, you know, were coming in from, from all over and they had very important things to do and they didn't really care about uh, anything that was already going on there before. So that it's, it's sort of like a, a new outpost of civilization. That comes through so strongly in so many, I guess, of the, the plots and story arcs um, throughout the collection. I love what you mentioned too about um, this sort of liminal space. Cause I think in, you know, in many cases we don't necessarily think of suburbia that way. Um, so I loved, I loved approaching that type of, um, I guess like repetitive landscape with totally new eyes. Yeah, you know, growing up in the suburbs, I didn't think anything exotic about it at all. I wanted to get out the second I realized what it was. Um, but then, you know, going back to it, <clears throat> you can maybe see how strange it really is. I was thinking about uh, what Ballard's novel Crash, where so much of the action occurs in the interchanges near an airport. Why? Because it's almost, it's, it's an in-between space, right? And so people are moving in and out of that constantly. And, and in some ways, the, the edge of the suburbs functions like that for me in this story. Definitely. I, I love the, like peering through the characters and the narrator's eyes as well. You definitely get that sense of defamiliarization. Um, and speaking of the character's perspective, many of the stories are in a first person POV or close third and there's this real sense of sort of embodiment of the narrator in many of them and specifically a male and masculine and often hyper masculine character um, and then the exception would probably be up from Grundy where um, it's it gets a little bit more omniscient and we kind of get to in, you know inhabit the bodies and emotions of two characters Mm -hmm. a high school wrestler and his wrestling coach. So how did you think about POV when drafting these stories? And is it something you begin with or something that you figure out as you keep writing? You know, I think, I mean, a, a lot of the stories are based on um, things that happen to me. So a first person, starting out in first person seems sort of natural. 
But I also found, because I wanted to write some in third, and I found myself writing in third person for these stories, and then the third person narration taking on the, the uh, linguistic twists and you know the accent of a character. And I thought about writing like that, and I said, well, no, wouldn't it be easier to just have the character tell the story again. So a lot, a lot of these stories wanted to be first person, I think, because um, there's, there's, there's a question of how much the narrator knows and how much the reader knows. And I think what I try to do with a lot of these stories is, is to conjure tension within the reader. If you have like, like an omniscient third that uh, ostensibly understands everything and knows everything and can drop in and out of certain characters, that omniscient third will have a set of values, um, you know, a morality um, that would transcend what's happening in the story. And I didn't want to give the reader that sort of uh, backdoor out of the story. I wanted the reader to have to deal with everything that the characters had to deal with and to come to his or her own understanding. Um, of the, the events that were happening because the narrator is just barely on the edge of trying to understand what's happening. And a lot of times the people that are you know, acting within the stories have a very clear understanding. It's just an understanding that may seem very alien to a lot of other people. You know? And I, I wanted to take that sort of alien behavior um, and make it casual. And as such, you know, the, the first person in a lot of these stories is sort of caught between behavior that he or she believes to be appalling uh, versus he's the only one that thinks it's appalling, right? And, and that was a lot, of the, um, a lot of the feelings that I had growing up at that time and place, you know, and, that, and trying to convey that was, was one of my major aims. Mm, that's really interesting that the type of narration provides a different, I guess, not no moral scaffolding, but a very different degree and very different type of sort of moral spine. Uh, yeah, less. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious what challenges or opportunities you felt between writing in the first person or writing in close third. So for Rowdy, that is in the third person. Um, versus Swiss Seat, which is one of the most sort of harrowing, at least um, harrowing in what we see <laughs> uh, yeah. stories in the collection, and that's written in first. So I'm curious to know a little bit about that experience as a writer. Yeah, I'm trying to remember why I chose third and first. I think both of those I tried the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I came to rest with it. I think one of the things with, with Rowdy, what I really wanted to do, I wanted to have a little more distance because I think that the protagonist in that story um, is confronted with maybe a, a different sort of conflict than characters in other parts of the story. So a lot of the stories are set up where you have, let's say a, a protagonist who's uh, watching abusive, racist, difficult behavior he doesn't understand. And he's trying to process that. Rowdy is the other way. Rowdy, the, the narrator, or excuse me, the protagonist, is trying to hold on to a very outmoded way of thinking. And he's confronted by uh, thinking from a completely different direction. Like, don't you see what you're doing and saying is regressive and hurtful? And so I wanted to have a little bit more distance so I could, so I could show him struggle with that, show him struggle with um, what it was he wanted to believe, even though he didn't completely believe it, right? Because un underneath that character in particular is this yawning gulf that he has not come to terms with um, and that he's been trying to cover over and cover over. And I think a lot of that story is, is he going to uncover? And if he does, you know, what's that going to look like? Mm. And there's a lot of wonderful 
action in that story as well that is so sparse that he just walks back inside at a really pivotal kind of moment in the conversation between the two of them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Those, oh, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say those those moments in particular. Um, and thing, things just it gets too close to the truth, and when it gets too close to the truth for him, he has no way to symbolize it. So, you know, scene change. At least that's how he handles it. Right. Right. Yeah, we've sort of been circling around this in our, you know, the last couple of minutes. And I'm I'm curious to know, since so many of these protagonists and narrators and characters are on the edge of something, you know, whether it's like the edge of some sort of internal truth or um, the edge of a conversation or of a, a type of intimacy between other characters, um, what draws you to people on the edge or the quiet observer or these people who are sort of passive recipients of information either about themselves or about the world. Yeah, um, I think it's a classic setup. Well, first off, I think authors are, are voyeurs, watching, remembering, uh, recollect, gathering, right? And so I think it's a classic setup because authors are naturally like this. They sort of hover, <laughs> um, get themselves into difficult situations, hover and record. And so to then write that down, if you write it from the perspective of the people that are literally doing the things, um, then you lose a little bit of the mediation that the reader might need. By the same token, if you go all the way third, I think that's too much mediation. And I think that sort of judging voice is not really believable or desirable. There's sort of a, a balance between the, the Dionysus of the actor and the Apollo of the, uh, you know, the god of the characters. Um, you know, I think of something like, like Great Gatsby, right? Where you have Nick who's watching Gatsby. Imagine if that story was narrated by Gatsby, it'd be a very different story. Um, but yeah, it, it also mirrors exactly, you know, how I situated myself as a young person growing up. What, you know, I, let's, let's have some adventures. Let's see what happens. But then things are happening. I'm like, oh, I don't want that to happen. I don't know about all this. Now, I'm not leaving, but I'm, I'm not going to like really participate. In kind of thing. So, <laughs> so that, that pattern comes out. Um, you know, when I wrote my first novel, um, I struggled with this same setup, the novels about the Mexican Revolution and Pancho Villa. And I wanted, I started writing in Pancho Villa in first person and I liked what I was writing. And I was like, this is good. And I'm like, how can I write like Pancho? I'm not Pancho Villa, what am I doing? And I'm like, stop. So then I spent literally years creating a series of mediating characters that had gone down to Mexico and were dealing with Pancho Villa. And, but if you watch, I don't know, any of the movies or even the other novels on Pancho, this is the setup. We're not going to get close enough to the thing. And so after a long time, because I didn't even like these mediating characters, I said, screw it. I'm not writing them well anyway. I'm going to go with the good writing and I'm going to go all the way into the thing. And going all the way into the thing is fun and it's interesting, but it's a, it's a very different kind of trip. Um, and I think that allows you to say a little bit less of broad things. Again, like, I could talk about this all day, don't want to stop. <laughs> the third person narrator is able to make all of these proclamations, right? Uh, the first person narrator can make all those proclamations, but the first person narrator's scope is so narrow. If you get somebody in between, he's, he's capable, he can gesture towards the third person proclamations, but not get, caught up in all the action of the first person. So I think that's why structurally it's, it's helpful. Um, my concern uh, with the stories is like, am I doing this too much? I'd, I'd send the stories to my friends. I send the collection to my friends and I'm like, am I like, is this trick happening too many times? I'm like, no, 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 it's good. So like, okay. Uh, but I, I was conscious of like, okay, we, we got a similar setup, but because the, the topics of the stories are so different, I figured out this thing. So. Uh, so you mentioned that a lot of these stories at least started from something in your real life or something that had really happened to you. 
And something that I was just so taken with throughout this whole collection is these really authoritative and detailed and kind of embodied descriptions of construction, carpentry, not tying, rigging, that's also sort of related to the military. And, you know, we really go into the characters' bodies as they're either doing this or reflecting on how they feel while they're doing it. And so I'm curious, you know, do you pull from your personal experience for that level of detail or does research play a role in your writing process? Yeah, uh, personal experience. But I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in a bar with another writer and he was working at a magazine that I wanted to get um, a story of mine in, uh, which is why I was sitting in the bar with him. And he was telling me about the sort of stories he wanted to read. And, and he said, I just want to read a story where people are doing something that I don't know anything about. Explain to me something that I don't know. And I said, really? That's what you want to read? He's like, I'd kill for a story like that. I said, well, OK, I could do that. And we talked about a lot of other things. But that stuck in my mind. Um, and at some point I was like, well, yeah, I can, I, I can, do you really want to read that? So I would start writing these things about doing things. And one of the things you find, one of the things I found is it's incredibly difficult to write complicated movements in a way that is clear and compelling and, um, forwards the story. Like I can, I can write about time knots all day long. It's going to bore you to tears. <laughs> but how do you make physical activity, how do you make the description of physical activity interesting and compelling? Um, it, it's fun. It's fun for me to, I can look at steps uh, and say, okay, this is what has to happen. But then there's a question of rhythm as well, because you can't just have a page and a half of a description of what hands are doing. People have to be talking. Okay, when does the talking come in? Um, people have to move. Okay, when does the moving come in? And how are they moving? And with especially the characters that I'm talking about, they are much more comfortable expressing themselves physically than any th through any sort of dialogue. Um, you know, they're not going to they're not going to give you a great deal of oratory, but they can tell you a lot about themselves by you know the way they use a hammer, or walk across a room, or you know things like this. So I when I started to do that, I said, okay, I've, I've I found a way to express these characters. Now, can I, can I do it in a way that's, uh, that fits in the story, in a way that you can follow? And that was, that was the challenge, trying to get in a way that you can follow. I just love that, uh, both sort of like authority and also room for wonder in the same craft aspect. Yeah, and I, and I think um, writers, I, uh, I'll generalize, I'll talk about myself. I <laughs> would think that, um, I'm like, yeah, I, I understand all kinds of things. I understand people's motivations. I understand where they come from and what they think and why they think that, where they go there. And then like, I have no idea how they do just their job. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you have to watch and pay attention. What you realize is that the, you believe that you have knowledge of what's happening and you have so little knowledge of what's happening. Right? You have su such, a, such a, a small grasp as, as to all the intricacies. Um, and so to, you know, to slow down and to discuss a physical process like that, you start to start to realize, oh, there, there's a lot more, there's a lot more things happening um, than maybe just what a, what a typical story might believe it's uncovering, if that makes sense. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, the physicality of these characters is also, as you say, sort of part of their interiority or where they won't go <laughs> um, yeah. when we do get to peer sort of inside, you know, their their heads and bodies. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about these characters. You know, many of them express a lot of hate towards others through, as you mentioned, sort of racism, xenophobia, misogyny. So I would love to know a little bit more about how you approach writing about hate, if that's how you view it, or if you view it in a different way, um, and what your goals were with theme throughout the collection. Yeah, the hate is the result of fear, which is a result of um, unfamiliarity. And, you know, certain language binds people together. If you agree to the language being used, you're now on the inside. And so many people are desperate to be on the inside. Um, 
I think growing up in the South and Southern people uh, might debate whether or not Virginia is the South. I would say having been in the North, it is the South. Growing up in the South and not <clears throat> feeling uh, a connection to the dominant culture, not understanding how it worked, even though I'm from the South, I'm from Virginia, uh, but a, a constant sense of strangeness and a constant sense of, I don't think this is necessarily correct, what we're doing and saying and believing, um, but looking around you and seeing no other voice uh, positing any other direction, um, it's very unsettling. And that sense of dis-ease was really one of the major things that I sort of wanted to get across in the book. Because also, growing up like that, you grow up in it. And as you grow up in it, it becomes a part of you. You interact with it. And so th there's not a clean break. You can't, to, to say like a, like a good guy and a bad guy kind of thing, I think is incredibly re too reductive for fiction. Maybe that's helpful in politics. I don't think if you're trying to get to like the heart of the human soul, you can start talking about good guys and bad guys. So once I realized that I had these characters and these things I wanted to express, I also realized that I had to do each one of them justice and to not necessarily show that they're capable of empathy, but um, empathize as a writer with each one of them. Each one of them is a human being just as capable of redemption as anybody else. Um, I think it's, and I, I want to continue writing about these sorts of things. I think it's dangerous to put up big walls, especially in fiction about character. We, we can talk about behavior that we find appalling, um, but characters that we find appalling, I don't necessarily know if you should have an appalling character. I think that's a, that's a lack of imagination. I think that maybe in the last 10 years, maybe more than that, as political stakes feel so much higher, I think a lot of readers might be looking for, I've talked to older writers about this and they say maybe this time reminds them of the 60s, you know, 67, 68, in which the question of what side are you on was a very important question. And there was a right side and there was a wrong side. And maybe we've entered that sort of area again. I'm not sure. Um, but if we have, I don't think that fiction is the place with characters um, where those things should, where that same framework should be laid down on top of. You know. That word redemption is really interesting. I'm curious what you think about this idea of hope. Like, is there is there hope for your characters? And if so, yes. for what? Yeah. Yes, I think the, the, these are by far the most hopeful stories I've ever written. Um, I think uh, because of no no characters are condemned in the stories. I don't think uh, you know even even the most to say each character is rounded is 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 dumb. Um, when I started writing stories, uh, I felt so afraid of the world uh, that the stories were defense and the stories were very uh, short and angry and ugly. Terrible people did terrible things to terrible people because I was young and I didn't believe that the world knew that terrible people did terrible things to terrible people. Like, of course they do. They do it all the time. I felt like I had like big news, you know. Um, <laughs> And I look back at those stories and I think they're like, te technically they're done well, but they're just so ugly that I can't take any pleasure from them. Um, as I've gotten older and, you know, learn more things and, and having kids was big for me as far as uncovering empathy, I didn't necessarily know that I had. But as, as my writing has matured or as I've matured as a person, I'm, I'm willing now to look at the vulnerabilities of people to, you know, to explore vulnerability on the page. Um, you know, I've had some, some friends of mine that they, they loved my first book, which was about a, a sociopath. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of things of, for, to love about that character. But they didn't like the second book because the second book shows broken people. It shows struggling people. It shows vulnerable people. Um, it takes people that think they are strong and, and shows they are nowhere near what they think they are. Um, and that's really uncomfortable for some people that want, you know, another kind of story. And it's interesting thinking about power in the way that these men sort of teach each other, um, because the ones who the outsider or onlooker in the story is sort of looking towards or employed by are often the ones that become the most broken by the end. Yeah, a lot of these characters are looking um, for some guidance. They're looking for mentorship. They're looking for people to show them how to be, uh, how to grow. Um, and in the case of so many you know, characters in this book, it's boys looking to figure out how to be men. And the men that they're surrounded by, the answers that they're given are, um, you know, perverse or hateful or incorrect or damaging or, you know, traumatizing. And, and the boys are willing to take these answers on because they're the only answers given. Is this manhood? Okay, I'll do it, right? And then the question is, what does that do to you if you accept that, right? You know, it's not just, just doesn't roll off your back. It shapes you. And now you've been shaped by that. And then how do you pass that on? Right, those, those are sort of the, the, uh, the bigger questions outside of the story. But, but you know, I hope that readers really sort of left with those questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. There are so many more questions I could ask about how those characters are rendered on the page. But in the interest of time, I think I'd love to zoom out and think about the collection as a whole. Um, so we open with, a uh, rather short, short story scenarios in which a group of high school aged kids are sort of debating the intricacies of the narrator's proposed suicide plot um, as if it's a performance. And then we end with Japanese Maples, one of my favorite stories in the collection um, that is almost entirely told in the form of hearsay. So what the narrator has heard about this woman that they bought their house from, um, an ex documentary filmmaker, who now is sort of approaching the world through fear and you know, rips up a whole grove of trees um, because she believes they've been infected with evil. Um, so how did you go about structuring the collection? Is there sort of an arc that you see from beginning to end um, or were there any particular challenges or goals that you had with the placement of the stories? You know, laying the stories out, the ones that I figured would go in. Um, from story to story, there's a big question of rhythm. If two stories were very similar, I didn't want them to happen back to back. Uh, but I also wanted a sort of propulsion through. So you finish one, let's say you finish a big long one, and then you get one that's like three pages, right? We don't want to overload. I also thought in terms of like, what stories were the most straightforward? And I wanted to sort of start with them because uh, I didn't want to confuse the reader. I wanted to get on base with some of the stories for you to be like, okay, I get this, I get this, I get this. And then once I've got this, once I got the reader with me, then I can open up uh, some of the stranger stories, um, sit a horse, you know, or something like that. The ones that are just barely holding together as stories, but I still like, um, like sit a horse, like I tried to fix. I'm like, this story's not working. I need to fix it. I kept trying to fix it. And I'm like, every time I fix it, it makes it worse. I think it's just barely supposed to be, just barely a story, but it had to be in there. I mean, for, for me, that story is, is really a sort of the dark heart of the whole book. So that has to be in there. But it, it's in the back half, um, I felt like I could get a little, a little more experimental um, with the stuff. Whereas in the game, I wanted to, to push you through quickly. Uh, I like how you talk about the last one, uh, Japanese Maples. What, what did you like about it? Well, I love, again, that it's sort of all told through what the narrator has heard, which is the most unreliable way of getting knowledge is rumors and, you know, hearing from your neighbors, right? So um, I love that it kind of takes the unreliable narrator to its extreme where we barely know anything about the narrator at all. Um, and I also loved that 
the documentary filmmaker, at least we assume if the world functions as our world does, this woman whose job it was to record the world and say something about the world as it is now sees something really dark and kind of like uh, impossible to contain um, in the world around her and maybe has broken with that same reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think there's levels to that story that I don't really recognize, to be honest. Um, it is more or less true. Uh, you know, that was a story I've moved into a house where then I was told that story by a neighbor. I said, you got to be kidding. But then you get told a story like that. And you say, well, I have to write it. <clears throat> so I write it and I look at it and I'm like, all right, now what else do I do? Because I think it's done. It's like, I don't know. Well, let's just put it aside. You put it aside and you pull it back out and like the feeling. Um, I, I liked the last paragraph of that and it felt like this, the um, collection should end on that last paragraph. Uh, but as to what else it does, I, I think some of the things you've said interest me in that she's scared by Japanese maples and the notion that they are, and I, I suppose I did feel this writing it, just, just even the, the name Japanese, they're, they're different. They don't come from here. They are exotic. And as such, uh, are a threat, which would fit in with you know so much more of the book and you know so much more of what happens, right? Uh, an older generation struggles with with difference and change, even as they themselves get old, and and with that age comes a lack of relevance, lack of importance, and something that I think people as they get older struggle that their thoughts and feelings and beliefs uh, simply aren't relevant anymore. So I'd love to end by asking you something we ask all of our authors corner featured authors, um, which is to talk a little bit about your publication process. Um, so that could be the timeline or just the experience of working with a small indie press. Well, I once I figured out the what the manuscript's going to look like and I was comfortable with it, um, then I got as many lists as I could of best small presses. I know I wanted to go to a small press, um, just sort of off of that. I didn't want to wrestle with the, you know, the whole agent process for, for this book. So I had my lists of small presses and this is like the middle of COVID. So I'm sitting on my couch in the afternoons while my kids are napping and I'm just working through the lists. Um, I'm, searching for all these things because some of the presses I know and some of them I don't. And then, you know, I've talked to other writer friends of mine, um, places they published and try to get, you know, feedback from that. And I was able, and this was a really fun period for me. I had, did not expect this to happen at all, but I was able to field offers from a couple of different presses. Um, and I went with the one that, uh, that really had, had the best offer. And it was, it was the one that, that loved most um, in the first place. And it's, it's been really, really, really great press that I've used. They've been, so supportive and so organized. Um, they answer questions, they pay, they keep me up to date on how it's selling. Um, we share spreadsheets back and I mean, it's been, it's been a dream um, to work with these people. And it's, it's really just the dedication and the focus and the organization of, of the people at the very top. If you don't have that, then the press is just gonna, it's not gonna do it. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I got into these books. Yeah. And we're happy that the book exists in the world. This is just one of my favorite short story collections I've read in recent memory. So it's been such a joy to talk to you about it. Great. It's been uh, wonderful to be able to do this. So for all of our viewers, you can pick up a copy of River Weather from Alternating Currents Press, and we'll have the link to purchase the book. Um, Cameron, do you have anything you would like to plug? Anything else in the works? Anything else we should be aware of? Mm. Yeah, as, as I've mentioned, I'm collecting um, rejection notices from, from uh, very high quality magazines right now. Um, <laughs> other, other than that, uh, you know, I, I have been sort of, you know, nursing that sense of rejection with sort of two projects. One is a collection of flash fiction that I think is almost done and uh, an ongoing novel that I've been writing and writing and writing and writing the novel 
um, hopefully goes back into the same territory as this collection of short stories, um, what was going on in Northern Virginia in the 90s, particularly um, between so many of the Latino population that was uh, really pouring into the county at the time and the, uh, the independent housing contractors um, and real, really the rural white people um, that I knew there at the time watching that interaction. Uh, and trying to build All right. Well, thank you so much, Cameron. Um, for anyone who's watching this in real time, Cameron will be our featured reader at the September Inner Loop reading on September 20th. Um, and if you are watching it in the future, thank you for being here. <laughs> and thanks so much, Cameron. It's been great. Thank you, Leah. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us in the author's corner. For more conversations with DC area authors and to stay updated about the latest from small independent presses, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook at The Inner Loop DC and on Twitter and Instagram at The Inner Loop Lit.